I fall in love It will be forever When Dad was home, there was a certain presence throughout the house. Everything just felt right. Everything felt complete. I always wanted to be like him. If I couldn't sing like him, just look like him. <laughs> he was the first African-American who had his own television show. That was unheard of in those days. His ability to get into the living rooms of America was in itself a statement of racial integration and racial reconciliation. All those children who were born during the lovemaking sessions of their parents listening to Nat King Cole could be this much black. And the moment I can feel that you feel that way the only black man ever to reach the level that he's reached in the musical field. If he were a boxer, he would have been Muhammad Ali. Nat was born in Montgomery, Alabama in 1919. And after the First World War, it was a very, very difficult place for a black man to raise a family. If a black man was lucky enough not to get beaten or lynched, it was highly unlikely that he would be able to find a job. Nat's father decided in 1923 to follow the great exodus of uh, black families that was moving from the South into Chicago. Chicago was to black people what Mecca was to Muslims and what Jerusalem was to the Jews. It was a land of promise, of freedom, of a better life. Jazz was the thing that people listened to. It was, I would say, equivalent to what hip hop is now. At the time, some of the greatest musicians, such as Louis Armstrong, Art Tatum, Earl Hines, had gathered in Chicago and were playing in an area of about eight square blocks. So there were 30 or 40 different venues for jazz. When Nat King Cole was about 10 or 11, he went to see Duke Ellington play at the local ballroom. And he was totally and utterly inspired and consumed by a passion to become a great band leader and composer and pianist. One night he was listening to his hero Earl Hines playing at the Terrace Ballroom, and when the radio blew a tube, Nat ran out to hear the rest of the set. He stood outside and listened, and Nat wanted to be just like Earl. I met Nat the first day that I went to this high school. Because they seated us alphabetically, he sat right in back of me. He was a very uh, likable person, Qu quiet, gentle. And if you didn't talk about music, you would hardly know that he was around. I had heard about this young man from other sources, and I was very proud to sit close to him. Most of the time, there would be other young men, mostly, coming in to talk 
with him about a gig, as they called it, that they had played the night before, and they would begin to swap ideas about how to make it good or better. I always wondered why he spent more time on his music than on his studies. But I didn't uh, resent that, because I was learning. This is my old homeroom, where I shared the classroom and the homeroom with, with Nat Cole. Used to be a piano right here, an upright piano. Every time he had a chance, he would play. There were occasions when the teachers would have a teacher's meeting, and we would charge others to come and hear Nat play. It was spellbinding. He never played the same tune the same way. He was an accomplished musician while he was in high school. Nat was an inspiration to all of us because his music was happy music. He grew up in the church. My grand father and my grandmother were ministers in the church and he would play the organ. He wanted to start playing, you know, basically popular music and that was like... May I welcome all of our visitors this morning? Good morning, ladies. First Church of Deliverance is a safe harbor and you can get to heaven from here. Having a father that was a minister definitely would have put a damper on the music that he was playing. Lord, have mercy upon me and incline my heart to keep thy law, amen. It was secular music, not something that was necessarily praising the Lord. There would have been conflict definitely from his father. The wonderful stories about Nat playing the organ in the church and jazzing up the hymns to a point where his dad would say, tone it down, son, or suffer the consequences. Amen. And his dad said, you can't play that popular music. So he taught himself how to play on the windowsill in his bedroom. He painted keys on the windowsill and taught himself how to play. And I think that's just like the coolest story I've ever heard. <laughs> Singing gospel in a black church was a wonderful experience. Back during the days of slavery, that was the only thing we could do. We had a chance to praise God and throw off all the suppression that we had come under for that whole week. We just laid it out, just got rid of it. A lot of music came out of that. It was difficult for my grandparents to be supportive and encourage my father because definitely that was just not done. They might have even been concerned about the odds being against him anyway as a black man trying to break into the popular music genre. By 1933 and 1934, during the Great Depression, when all of the families in the South Side were suffering one way or the other, Nat had his own band, and they were beginning to make fairly decent money. Nat's picture was beginning to appear in the Chicago Defender. He was becoming famous, a child prodigy, something like Stevie Wonder. To have your picture in the Defender 
during this time, it wasn't just famous people, it was also socially significant people. So for him to have his picture in and to have things written about him would signify that he was important, definitely. This is at 58th between Calumet and Prairie in Chicago. And this was a very interesting street. It was kind of tough around here. They called it Dodge City. Had a lot of life to it, a lot of nightlife. And there was a nightclub here called the Panama Inn, about where that tree is there. At that time, there was no tree there. <laughs> Matt Cole played there. He was still in school, and it was because of his work here that he was unable to get to school on time. But this was what we might say the initiation of the professional career of Nat Cole. From this, from this place, he went on to greater and greater things. For Nat to become a national idol, he had to overcome the local idols as well. And one of those was the great Earl Hines, who was not only local to Nat, but he was one of the big names in American jazz. And Nat took him on in what was called the Battle of the Bands at the Savoy Ballroom. You'd really have to have some, some pretty strong firepower to go up against guys like Earl Hines. I mean, you, you'd, you'd really have to be playing some, some serious piano. I can't play like Earl Hines, but this is the sort of thing. A lot of people who saw the Eminem film, Eight Mile, would have been very impressed by the rap battles and think, wow, this is something new. Well, in a battle of rhythm in 1935, Ralph Father Hines against Nat's schoolboy Cole, they would do alternate sets, and you would judge who was winning by the volume of applause. The Savoy Ballroom that night was absolutely full. There must have been 2,000 people in that ballroom. It made the younger guys do the very best, which was, and of course we supporters of the younger guys, gave them the loudest applause. Earl Father Hines and Nat Cole's cats swung down to a low gravy at the Savoy on September 7th. Nat didn't wash Earl, but he was in his collar all night. You gotta give it to these kittens. They rehearse every day from 11 to 5 at the Union, and when he turns that five-part brass tone, the bricks in the wall begin to jump around. <laughs> Newspapers called it a draw, but that is a victory for the underdog because it means he's as good as the champion. And, and that really helped to set Nat Cole on his way. When I come to Chicago, I wasn't going to play guitar, I was going to play piano. And the first two people I ran into was Art Tatum and Nat Cole. And that was enough to tell me to pick up a guitar and <laughs> forget the piano. It was very well taken care of. <laughs> he often played with a chorus line of young, beautiful young women. And I think out of that, he was uh, captured by one of the girls. Nat first met Nadine in 1936 at the Panama Cafe. She was an extraordinary dancer. Nat was maybe 16 years old when he met her. She was 28. They were married in 1937 in uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan, en route uh, to LA. I've seen photographs of her and she was just so striking and, and really lovely. I know there was a disparity in their ages. I believe she was a dancer. When they came to California, they came together in the show, UB Blake show, Shuffle Along. And I think there was migration going on in those times. 
great musicians coming up into L.A. and checking it out and getting together and playing. My father must have felt some kind of connection to Los Angeles. There was a feeling of wide open spaces. Everything was new. Everything was a possibility. The Shuffle Along adventure came to L.A., did very well, but I think someone ran off with the purse one week, and there they were stranded. Those were tough times, and I think as tough as it was, I get the feeling it was exciting. There was something in his spirit that said, I'll go for it. My father was a far more ambitious man than I ever realized. Central Avenue in the 20s, 30s, and 40s was a wonderful place. This was the mecca for the black community in Los Angeles at that time. It was the center. It was like the sun. We all revolved around it. This is where all the musicians played, so this was fertile ground. You had all the great bands. You had Ray Charles here. You had the Duke Ellingtons, the Count Basies, the Sarah Vaughan, the Lena Horns, and all the musicians who played behind these great folks. When Nat King Cole came here, he was a jazz pianist. He really hadn't gotten his vocal career off the ground, but the sound was phenomenal. Yeah. Now, if you're in the audience, you're on the side of something that's so exciting, your body can't contain itself. You were dancing, you were singing, you were sweating. I mean, this was the end of a work week, and now you've got all these bands playing all night long. place where the chops were made, the careers were built, and the music is still playing. In Chicago, he was a celebrity, and suddenly he found himself in Los Angeles, where a lot of black musicians didn't have work. It was during this period that he created this wondrous thing, the jazz trio. It was different than anything I'd heard. Completely different. They were simply marvelous. They were very, very good friends, and they communicated beautifully, both musically and as men. The sound was just totally unique. I had never heard anything quite like it. Not ever. I met Matt and knew him. And he was a piano player, and an excellent one. But it was quite amazing to hear him sing. And I said to him, I said, you know, Nat, you should be a singer. Stop your teasing, come to baby dear. The only way he could get a job at, at one time was if he sang some songs. The, the nightclub owner wouldn't book him unless he sang, and he said, I, I, don't, I never sang in my life. He said, no, just start singing. And he was so natural as a singer. I've just found joy. I'm as happy as a baby boy. They put lightning cream on his uh, face the beauty standard of the day was, you know, you were just more attractive if you had lighter skin. They literally were trying to lighten him up to make him more, what, acceptable to a white audience. We were 
second-class citizens. And we were depicted as such in how we were called upon to perform. With another brand new choo-choo child. When I met my sweet Lorraine, Lorraine, Lorraine. I don't know who instigated that idea. I don't know anything about it except it was horrible. It looked like clay. Nat King Cole was born Nathaniel Coles. Eventually he changed his name to Nat King Cole by deed poll. Where did the king come from? Wesley Prince, he was the first bass player with Nat. He says he was the one that, that put the king in. Is King, is that really part of your name? No one of the members of my group thought that one up back in 1937. Right. He put a crown on my head and sang, Old King Cole was a merry old soldier. Ah, so it really soldier. is associated with the old nursery rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. The war affected everyone who lived through it, and it affected every recording artist in some way. One thing that he was great at was summing up the mood of the era, and I think that's one of the reasons why he was hugely successful. Wesley got called up, and Johnny Miller came in on bass to replace Wesley Prince. Nat got exempt because he had flat feet. But since I have got flat feet, I'm not going with the draft. I served in the United States Armed Forces during the Second World War. And whenever the King Cole Trio record Straighten Up and Fly Right was played, it commanded. He was special to the world because of what he left. What he left them was his voice. Unforgettable. That's what you are. Unforgettable. Though near or far. He sets an example to show what a true entertainer is all about. Like a song of love. Whatever you're going through, just smile and you do it. How the thought of you does things to me. Never he was personification of cool. He was cool. Before it was cool to be cool. Has someone been God just put his hand on Nat's head and said, you're going to be the one with this voice. You can't compete with that. And forevermore. His legacy is the love that he left behind and the songs that he did. He had an everlasting light. That's why, darling, it's incredible. My father's music tends to reach that sense of spirituality. It tends to get into our soul. And it kind of just stays there. Thinks that I am unforgettable. In a class by himself. That was it with me. I loved him. <laughs>